Good to see you this morning. I, as a proclaimer of the gospel, have the responsibility to teach the truth. If you find out anything that I teach this morning or any other time is not the truth, and I mean in the Bible, let's sit down and talk about it because I am accountable for that and you're accountable for what you believe. When you go back to the garden, you see that Eve was accountable for believing the lie of Satan. And fast forward to 1 Kings chapter 13, the kingdom that was once united is at this time divided and you have two kingdoms. You have Israel, as it's called, to the north, and then you have Judah to the south. And Judah had the city of Jerusalem within its kingdom. So there is a king over the northern tribe, Israel, King Jeroboam. And when we get to 1 Kings chapter 13, he has set up his own religion because his motive is that he doesn't want his kingdom, his people, his subjects going to Jerusalem to worship as God had told them to do and to owe covenant. He's afraid that he will lose their loyalty, that they'll stay and he'll lose his kingdom. So he sets up out of convenience his own religion and he sets up a golden calf in Dan and Bethel and he's having the people worship them and anybody can serve as a priest, not just those that God had commanded to serve as priest. In fact, he is attending to the altar in, in Bethel in uh, 1 Kings chapter 13. But a man of God from Judah had come to Bethel. And he is not going to allow this to happen. And after that, we see that he has been given specific instructions to God how he, being a man of God, is to go back to Judah from Bethel. But there's an old prophet that comes, and in order to get the man of God to, to come to his house, he lies to him. He lies to him and says that that's what God says that you need to do. So the man of God goes, and guess what? He is the one that dies. And sometimes I think when we read 1 Kings chapter 13, we think, did the wrong person die? The one that told the lie isn't caused to die there, but the one that believed it is. It's an important lesson for us that God holds us accountable whether or not we believe a lie. I appreciate the church in Berea in the first century who in Acts 17 when the apostle Paul himself was preaching there that they searched the scriptures daily to find out whether or not those things are so. It's a, we are held accountable for what we, we believe. You think about in the secular world more and more unsuspecting people are being deceived every day. With all the scams that we have, people are giving their personal information because they trust that something is right and they don't realize they're being scammed. And it's horrible because some of these people are elderly and, and they lose their life savings or their retirement. But as bad as that is, something that is worse is that people are being spiritually scammed and they're putting their faith in lies that are unscriptural. And we need to be sure that we are not deceived by false teaching. I want us this morning to look at, I believe in Scripture, the letter of 1 John in chapter 4, the first six verses, a guide to discernment. And that's what we're going to do to guard ourselves against being deceived and believing religious lies is to be able to discern between what is true and what is false. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, Paul, in writing to Timothy, who was preaching in Ephesus, wrote, Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. You see, these false teachers are luring people with their false promises. And no wonder the Apostle John gave us this guide to discernment. In 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. 
Let's be sure that we realize that we must make discernments and be able to distinguish between what is right and wrong because our soul is at stake. The first point I want us to understand in this guide to discernment that is in the text of 1 John chapter 4 is in verse 1, the need for discernment. John writes, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. There the word spirit is talking about the spirit of man, the inner being, the mind, the character, the disposition. And the inspired writer, the apostle John, is warning, do not believe everything that you hear taught spiritually. Every teaching, every reading that you come across that deals with religious topics, don't believe it. It makes a difference what you believe. We are accountable for that. In Ephesians, I'm sorry, 1 John chapter 4, verse 1, you see here the need for it to be able to distinguish. And in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 14, Paul writes that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. We need to grow up spiritually. We need to be mature. We need to know the Word of God. We don't need to allow ourselves that everything we hear, oh, okay, I'll, I'll step over here and I'll believe that. Or I'll... The wind's blowing this way. I'm going to believe that. No. We need to grow up spiritually. To be able to test the spirits, it says there in 1 John chapter 4, verse 1, that means to prove. That means to scrutinize. And I think to discern spiritually in teaching, we need to not only be able to tell the difference, to make a distinguishment about what's right and wrong, but also... We need to be able to distinguish what is right and what is almost right. Because herein lies so much trickery in religion. They take things that are true, but they don't tell the whole truth. We need to be able to be good discerners when it comes to religious matters, and that comes through study and spiritual exercise of our senses. In Hebrews chapter 5, verses 12 through the end of the chapter, the writer tells us this, For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God, and you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes uh, only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe, but solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Why do we need to be able to make these discernments, to study, to, to know these things in depth, and to mature in the knowledge of the Word of God. The reason is, it says there in 1 John chapter 4, verse 1, is because many false prophets have gone out into the world. There's a lot of false teaching out there. And they, these false teachers may appear very sincere. They may appear very loving and caring. And they may appear to be very spiritual-minded people. In Matthew chapter 7 and verse 15, the Word of God says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You see, they disguise themselves. They look devout. They look religious. They look like they care about your soul. They look like they're sincere. Be careful. Looks can be deceiving. We need to, everything that we hear, compare it to what the Word of God says. In 2 Corinthians 11, verses 13 through 15, Paul is writing to this church in Corinth that is living among much false teaching, as all churches always have throughout the history of the church. But in 2 Corinthians 11, verses 13 through 15, Paul warns them, for such are false apostles. <clears throat> 
deceitful workers, transforming, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ, and no wonder. For Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to the works. When you read that second letter of Corinthians, you see over and over again, the Apostle Paul is showing them that he is indeed an apostle of Christ. Why? Why is he giving them that proof? Because there's so many that claim to be, and he says they are not. And it's no wonder that they're doing that, because the one they follow, and that Satan, disguises himself. We need to be able to see through that disguise and get to the truth of the matter. So when you think about the guide of discernment in 1 John chapter 4, the first six verses, the need for discernment is there in verse 1. The second thing we see is the basis the basis for discernment. Look at verses 2 and 3. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God, and every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, it says, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. So what is the basis that John mentions here? Those that confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh and that he is of God. Those that do not, they're not true. They're false. But it's more than just acknowledging the fact and confessing the fact that Jesus uh, did come in the flesh, and he is of God. It's more than that because when you look in the next chapter, if you'll look at 1 John chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, you see, whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves him, who begot him also, we see, uh, is begotten of him. But this we know, that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. So if you believe that Jesus did come in the flesh and that he is God, you need to believe that he is both deity and that he came in the flesh, and when he came in the flesh, he never quit being God. He's always been God. But if you truly believe that and confess that, John goes on to say that you'll keep his commandments. You'll keep, so that's the basis of discernment. To deny Jesus' deity and to deny that the Son of God came in the flesh is to deny that we have a Savior. In Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 17, the inspired writer tells us, therefore, in all things, he had to be made like his brother. That means that he became flesh, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in all things pertaining to God. He's from God. He's deity to make propitiation for the sins of the people. If this were not true, we would not have our Savior in Jesus Christ. But because we do, we keep His commandments and we discern from the Antichrist that don't believe in Him. You see, the Antichrist, the spirit of the Antichrist that John is talking about here are those that deny the authority of Jesus Christ. They deny His Word. In Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 21, it talks about far above all principalities and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age which is to come. We know that our world is full of people that deny the deity and authority of Jesus Christ. The Spirit, unfortunately, that Spirit is rampant in our world. So we must cling to the standard. The standard is the powerful Word of God. In Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12, it des describes to us how Scripture, the Word of God, is the scalpel that God wants us to base our discernments on that is able to dissect and see through false teachers and the Antichrist spirit to tell the difference between what is right and what's almost right and what's right and what's wrong, to see the difference. Because he says, For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, 
piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The Word of God is the standard. If you're having a religious discussion with someone and they bring a book that's been written by men, a creed, you've got to realize that the basis for our discernment is the Word of God. And that's where we go. And it's complete. And it will thoroughly equip us to every good work. It's all that we need to be saved. It's the words by which we're going to be judged according to John chapter 12 and verse 48. So the reason these brethren had overcome these false teachers is because the word of God dwelled in them. In 1 John chapter, in Titus chapter 1 and verse 9 it says, holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convince those who contradict. We need to be able to do that. And I left this out, but also in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 14, John writes, I have written to you fathers because you have known him who is from the beginning. I have written to you young men because you are strong and the word of God abides in you. And you have overcome the wicked one. And then in verse 24 of 1 John chapter 2, Therefore let uh, that abide in you by which you've heard from the beginning. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and in the Father. The Word of God is the basis and it must be put in our hearts. In Psalm chapter 109 and verse 11 it says, Hide the Word of God in your heart that you might not sin against God. And that's what we need to do. Being able to discern what is good and what is evil. The evidence of discernment we see in 1 John chapter 4 verses 4 through 6. John goes on to say in our text, You are of God little children and have overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are of the world, therefore they speak as of the world and the world hears them. We are of God. He who knows God hears us, and he who is not of God does not hear us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. It becomes evident in how we live. And that word, him talking about uh, hearing, that implies understanding. And that implies obedience. God expects us to overcome and to obey. Paul, you remember, was marveling because so many so soon were departing from the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he says in Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 9, I marvel that you are turning away so soon at, from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another. But there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than that which you have received, let him be accursed. People departing from the truth and it becomes evident in the way that they, they live. In 2 John verse 9, 2 John verse 9, it says, Whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. Do you have the Word of God dwelling in you richly as we're told to do? That you respect the authority of God's Word? that you believe it is the standard, and are you living according to it? In 1 John chapter 5 and verse 19, we know that we are of God, and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. Don't fall into the snare of those that teach false doctrine. Look in 1 John chapter 4, the first six verses, at this guide of discernment that we must have to be pleasing to God. See the need for it in verse 1. See, the basis for it is the Word of God. That's the standard in 2 and 3. 
and see the evidence of discernment and make sure that that is in your life. Why are there so many religions in the world? God is not the author of confusion. Jesus Christ is the author and finisher of our faith. Why are there so many different religions? Why are there so many false things being told in the name of religion today? It is up to us not to believe those lies and to stick with the truth in the Word of God. So many people are teaching things that are appealing, and that's what we're competing with when we go to talk to someone that's lost in their sins. They're teaching things like playing Musical instruments in worship today is authorized in Scripture. They're teaching that divorce for any reason is acceptable to God. They're talking about that you can be saved by faith alone. And that one church is as good as another. It doesn't matter the difference as long as you recognize God. One church is as good as any other. What about that one church it talks about in Ephesians chapter 4? And giving to human institutions from the collection to carry out a congregation's work is scriptural. That's what the liberals are teaching. Or once saved, always saved. There's nothing that you can do to lose your salvation once you have it. And miracles still exist today and the list goes on and on and on, unfortunately, that appeal to what man wants and desires. But what we should desire and what should appeal to us the most is what God's Word says and what we need to do to be pleasing to Him. And I trust that you look in Scripture and all of these things that are false, you'll see them as such because you'll be able to make discernments between what is right and wrong, between what is right and almost right. You will not be led astray. Salvation is a very important thing. The Bible tells us, here's the verses that back it up and so many more could be used. We need to hear the word of God. Faith comes by hearing Romans chapter 10 and verse 17. And that faith that we need to have is not just a faith that says I acknowledge that God exists. That's the kind of faith according to James chapter 2 that works, that, that leads to obedience. Belief, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, Acts chapter 16 and verse 31. You know, the man from Ethiopia, Philip, was preaching to him in Acts uh, chapter 8. And he, the, the Ethiopian said, what, what is it that hinders me from being baptized? And he says, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And here in Acts chapter 16, Paul and Silas were in prison and God through his power, sets them free. And they're talking to the Philippian jailer. And they say that, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Repent. God commands it. Acts chapter 17 and verse 30. Confess that you believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Romans chapter 10 and verse 9. Be baptized. It's baptism that now saves us according to 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 21. And Jesus says in that letter to the church at Smyrna in Revelation 2 and verse 10, be faithful unto death. You're going to suffer, but you hang on to your faith and you be faithful unto death. If you've already become a child of God, been baptized into Christ, had your sins washed away, the Bible teaches that you can lose that salvation. And Jesus in those letters to the seven churches of Asia, the solution to their problems each time was repent. If you need to repent, do so. Don't leave here this morning having a false belief that you're right with God and that you're on the way to heaven if that's not the case. Be honest. Look for the truth in God's Word and follow it. This is the book that will lead you to eternal life. Every soul here is precious to God. I don't care how you feel about me, but you follow God and the truth in His Word because your soul is precious to Him.
Do what you need to do to be saved according to God's word. Come if you need to while together we stand and sing.